Okay. Well, thanks everybody for coming. And um, I'm gonna speak for maybe about 20 minutes or so and then we'll have time for question and answer and break up in small groups and so forth. So I assume that everyone here is upset by the state of the world today. We have every right to be angry. We live in a world where 85 people own as much wealth as the bottom half of humanity. That's 3.5 billion people. We live in a world where billions live on one or two dollars a day and 30 million children die of starvation and malnutrition every year. Where clean water is an unobtainable luxury for billions while the grasping 1% sit on trillions of dollars in unused cash. Where Boeing has stolen the pensions of yesterday it was 30,000 workers, as of today it's 100,000 workers. At the same time as it has so much profit that it bought back $10 billion worth of its own stock. Where our bus system struggles for years to find $75 million to keep service intact. While the lap dogs in the legislature of both major parties fall all over themselves to grant Boeing $8.7 billion in tax breaks. In a matter of days, $8.7 billion coincidentally being the exact amount of the recent cut in the SNAP, food stamp program. Where the most essential and hardest working people, those who pick our crops, care for our children, sweep our floors, serve our food, clean our bathrooms, and care for our elderly are paid the lowest wages. While those who speculate in stocks, make real estate deals, and bankrupt our economy, take lavish incomes, that would make the robber barons and the crown heads of Europe of previous age blush in shame. Where those who contribute the most get paid the least, and those who contribute the least take the most. Where the richest nation in the world has the highest incarceration rate in world history, where black and Latino men can be expected to be stopped by police just because of their race, where black, there are more black men in prison today than there were slaves in the plantations of 1850. Where capital is free to move anywhere it wants, and people are controlled, restricted, and jailed for trying to cross those imaginary lines on the map that we call national borders. Where women are treated like sex objects to make a profit and are denied basic reproductive justice and freedom. Where the LGBTQ people are bashed, fired, and generally discriminated against just for their sexual orientation, orientation and gender identity. We, we, where uh, imperialist rivalry, including the prospects of war, are ever present, as the crisis in Ukraine shows us today. Where most fundamentally, the 1% are willing to risk the destruction of the planet just to milk out the last time of profit from fossil fuels. In a world where clean energy is abundant and we now have the technology to produce it. As, Howard, as historian Howard Zinn put it, the wrong people are in prison and the wrong people are free. Capitalism has been, always been exploitive and oppressive. It has always threatened humanity. As German revolutionary Rosa Luxemburg said 100 years ago, we face a choice of socialism or barbarism. In the light of the climate crisis and other capitalist-induced environmental crises, we can, we can say the choice today is socialism or the threat of extinction. In the, world, in the words of the global justice movement, another world is possible. And now we can add another system is necessary if we are to survive. Everyone in this room can come up with a long list of the horrors of capitalism. My talk tonight will contend that these horrors flow not from human nature or from greed or even the greed of the 1%, but from the economic system itself. I contend that we need to fight not just the evils of capitalism, but the system itself. And I'll try to explain why we need to replace it with socialism. Okay, we all understand that capitalism as currently constituted is a threat to human life. But couldn't there be a kinder, gentler capitalism? Of course, throughout history, people have built mass movements that challenged even, and even changed aspects of capitalism. The Civil Rights Movement ended Jim Crow segregation in the South. Women in the U.S. briefly won abortion rights and legal equal pay, although real equal pay is still a long way off. Workers have won the right to have unions and better pay, social security, unemployment compensation. We even have a Clean Air Act and a Clean Water Act, which is supposed to protect the environment. So why can't we just keep this up and turn, gradually turn capitalism into its opposite? There are two problems with this approach, which is called reformism or social democracy. The government under capitalism, whether a military dictatorship or a formal democracy like we have in the United States, is dominated by capitalist interests. 
Each government and governmental apparatus has to complete, compete in the world with every other one. In order to control their territory, they need a strong military apparatus. To build a strong military, they need a strong economy. In a capitalist world economy, this means that each government must favor capitalist interests. That is the exploitation of workers and dividing workers against each other by using oppression. The reality of the world competitive capitalist system is supplemented by many other measures by which the capitalist class rules the political system. It uses its position as the economically dominant class to become the political ruling class. These include bribery, campaign contributions, using economic power to bend legislatures to their will, etc. A good example of this is the recent Boeing debacle in, in the state of Washington, where Boeing got all these tax concessions from both political parties. Overturning Citizens United would be a good, a good step, but it would still leave the basic pro-capitalist bias of the, of the government intact. Because the pro-capitalist bias of the government is true all over the world, and not just in the United States. Because of this dynamic, even when mass movements win reforms from the government, the capitalist class and its governments take back those reforms whenever the mass movement recedes. We see this today. The gains of the 30s and the 60s are either under attack or have already been rolled back. Welfare, unemployment compensation, social security, affirmative action, etc. Since the Great Recession started in 2007, austerity has ripped through every level of government at the state, local, and national level around the world. Whether these governments are called social democratic or even cap or open capitalist governments like the United States. Nearly 100 years of social democratic governments in Europe have not changed the fundamental drives of capitalism. Even the most uh, solid uh, social democratic states in Scandinavia are cutting their social programs in the face of the world economic crisis. But there is an even deeper reality to capitalism. It is a fundamentally competitive system. Each corporation must maximize its, its profit in order to survive. It has to have as much money as possible to buy the most modern machinery possible, to sell its goods as cheaply as possible. To do this, it has to cut corners on the environment, pay workers as little as possible. The wealth of capitalism is accumulated by exploiting workers. Workers are not paid the full value of what they produce. Their unpaid labor is accumulated as profit. No laws or other changes in capitalism can alter this fundamental dynamic. It can be reformed on the surface, but it cannot be reformed in a fundamental way. As the old saying goes, you can peel an onion layer by layer. You cannot declaw a live tiger claw by claw. Capitalism is a tiger, not an onion. So if, we, if it will take a revolution to get rid of capitalism, what kind of revolution would that be? Marx examined capitalism and saw that workers were the class that was exploited and on whom capitalism relied for its profits. Workers had the power to cut off profits and bring the system to its knees. Workers not only had the power to overthrow capitalism, but they had the interest in doing so. Capitalism rests fundamentally on exploitation and cannot exist without it. However, it also relies on the oppression of all workers. Workers in general are oppressed. They are told what to do by their exploiters and their agents the whole workday. They are denied the right to democratically control their lives. Their choices as consumers are limited by the capitalist need for profit. They are alienated from their work lives and from each other. Capitalism sees people as means to an end and treats people as such. This then spreads over to alienated human relations throughout the whole society. Besides this, workers who are specially oppressed, as women, people of color, immigrants, LGBTQ workers, etc., are treated as less than full human beings based on these characteristics. All told, a vast majority of workers are not only oppressed in general, but are specially oppressed as well. This gives workers both a fundamental power and interest in overthrowing capitalism. Of course, this is countered by the power of the capitalists over the means of mental production, uh, the media, etc. It takes struggle and organization for workers to overcome capitalist conditioning. But over and over again, workers have risen up and overthrown or nearly overthrown the system. A short list of examples include Germany, 1918 to 23, China, 1925 to 1927, Spain, 1936, 
East Germany, 1953, Hungary, 1956, France, 1968, Chile, 1971 to three, Portugal, 1974, Iran, 1979, Poland, 1980, Philippines, 1986, and of course, the Arab Spring starting in 2011 and continuing today. In Russia in 1917, the revolution went further and actually got rid of the old governmental apparatus and created a workers' government and began to move towards socialism for a few years before the counter-revolution, which was led by Stalin. So what was Marx's alternative to capitalism? Marx looked at the history of working class revolutions and came to some conclusions. When workers were organized and conscious enough, they would eliminate the capitalist governmental structure and replace it with a worker state, democratically controlled by the vast majority. Once workers took revolutionary political power, they would use that power to transform the economy, to take collective ownership and control over it. This would, be, this would need ultimately to happen on an international scale to get rid of the competition between states. Everything couldn't happen at once, but workers would take control of the economy and shift its fundamental drive to human needs instead of profit over time. The market and competition would be replaced by democratic planning, public ownership, and workers' control. Of course, one of the most fundamental human needs is the need for a healthy environment. This would mean a rapid shift away from fossil fuels and nuclear power to clean energy. To be sure that the unity of the working class was not broken up, the workers' government would need to take radical and immediate steps to dismantle institutional racism, sexism, etc. Over time, as the economy developed, more and more abundance increased, money would lose its significance, importance, and finally disappear, along with class divisions. The work week would be cut drastically as the waste activities of capitalism, banking, real estate, stock market speculation, advertising, arms production, etc., are eliminated. Finally, in what Marx called the higher stage of communism, the guiding principle of society be would become from each according to their ability to each according to their needs. Leisure would increase. Then people would be able to develop themselves in an all-round way. As Marx put it, the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all. Or as John Lennon described communism in Imagine, one of my favorite songs of all time, imagine no possessions. I wonder if you can. No need for greed or hunger, a brotherhood of man. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for. Imagine all the people living life in peace. The vis this vision has nothing in common with what has often been called socialist or communist countries. Russia under Stalin, China under Mao, Cuba under the Castros. Marx's vision was fundamentally democratic. The key was to remake the re relations of production, workers' democracy at work and throughout society. This would only happen if the workers did it themselves. This is why Marx called socialism the self-emancipation of the working class. In the so-called socialist and communist societies, a new real ruling class exploited the workers in order to compete with the other capitalist states. They built up military power and developed the economy to accumulate and have the basis for a strong military. Stalin started the process by leading a counter-revolution against the workers' government in Russia in the 1920s. The later so-called communist societies were modeled on Stalin's. In all of these states, not only exploitation but oppression as well returned. A literary version of the overthrow of workers' power and its replacement by Stalinism is laid out in George Orwell's Animal Farm. For the reasons outlined about before, social democratic parties have only modified capitalism. Now they have abandoned even the nominal goal of socialism, and they have largely adopted neoliberal policies. But is Marx's vision possible? It is for two reasons. Capitalism developed the, economy, the technology to provide a society of abundance. With new technology that can provide clean energy, new organic farming techniques, etc., we could provide a decent living standard to everyone in the world without destroying the earth. The other basic force for socialism is the working class itself. It is the first class that produces collectively on a large scale and has the potential to provide for everyone. The working class has continually shown its potential to transform the system. Besides numerous examples of actual working class revolution that I just mentioned, uh, history is full of the historic struggles against exploitation and oppression. Early strikes and union movements, the anti-globalization movements, starting in Chiapas in 1994, and then in Seattle in 1999,
the Occupy movement two years ago, and finally, the massive anti-austerity movements sweeping the world today. Bosnia, Greece, Spain, most of Europe, Latin America, Africa, and Asia. If workers' revolutions can lay the basis for a post-capitalist society, how can we, here today, contribute the, to that process? As noted before, workers have made several attempts at socialist revolution over the last 150 years. In the earliest attempts, capitalism wasn't developed enough to sustain a society of abundance. After Russia, the other re revolutions never succeeded in, in getting rid of the old capitalist governmental apparatus and replacing it with the workers' democracy. The main reason they failed was the lack of a large enough revolutionary organization that could lead the process. The capitalists are highly organized and have all the physical and mental means of production at their disposal. To defeat them, workers too have to be highly organized. The socialist revolution cannot be willed into existence. Capitalism is a crisis-ridden system. A deep economic and social crisis will create a situation where, as Lenin put it, the ruling class can no longer rule in the old way, and the oppressed classes are no longer willing to be ruled in the old way. When this happens, the question will be, are workers well enough organized to carry through and take power? To be sure that workers will be ready, we need to contribute as much as possible to building socialist organization today. This is necessary not just to be sure we are organized when the revolutionary crisis comes, but also because a clear understanding of our goals can help to provide the best strategies and tactics and movements today. For example, in the movements of today, Marxists argue for no support to either political, major political party, mass struggle as opposed to terrorism or supporting politicians, the need to fight oppression now to unify the working class, support for all workers' struggles against exploitation, rejection of any support to imperialism, and support for self-determination of nations. And finally, find, founding all these movements on democratic principles, uh, making sure that the people involved in them democratically control those movements. To contribute the most to bringing about a socialist transformation, socialists do two, uh, three things. Participate in and build as much as possible any struggle against the evils of capitalism today. Learn from other activists they work with, and finally lay the basis for a revolutionary party by building socialist organization. The three are directly related. Revolutionary organization can help movements be more successful and Increasing movements against capitalism can create more conscious revolutionaries. So where does that leave the people in this room tonight? I would like to make three recommendations. First of all, continue and intensify the work that I know most people in this room are already doing in the movements that they're involved in. Secondly, seriously consider Marxism, revolutionary socialism, as an alternative to capitalism. Consider Marxism as a fulfillment of the progressive struggles against the oppression, exploitation, war, and environmental destruction. Look into Marxism. Read about it. Talk to Marxists about it. And finally, if you decide that Marxism is the best way to transform the world in a healthy direction, seriously consider joining a Marxist organization. Do an investigation of the politics of the various groups that exist with a view to joining one. That's it. <laughs> Okay, uh, questions, comments, all that kind of good stuff. What, what part of, of the Socialist Party is the ISO? Uh, or is it? Or what's the, organiza the organization of the Socialist Party um, in this country? Well, there are, there are many different socialist groups, and, okay. and there's, there's one group called the Socialist Party, which runs candidates, but there's a lot of other, other groups, and the ISO is one of those. And, um, we come from this tradition that we're talking about against Stalinism, uh, for real grassroots working class democracy, internationalism, and so forth. Um, and um, in, in Seattle, we're involved in several different things. We're involved in the uh, 15 Now campaign, um, the Seattle Education Association, where we have some members who are running, um, who are actively involved in C, which is social equality educators, which are trying to make the union more um, anti-racist and taking up social issues more. We're involved in the Seattle Clinic Defense, which defends um, reproductive justice, reproductive freedom for women. Uh, the No New Jim Crow campaign, which fights against um, racial injustice and mass incarceration. And uh, 
we're also involved in a lot of union activity as well. So. Mm -hmm. okay. How would you respond to the uh, notion that, well, you know, capitalism isn't the problem because we're not really living in a pure capitalist society here in the United States? Okay. Um, yeah, that's that's one that came up in our discussion group. Um, yeah, basically, there there has never been such a thing as pure cap pure that is free market capitalism, like Milton Friedman writes about, or things like that, where everything is the market. Um, capitalism was created in some ways um, in England. Anyway, there was a royal government which kicked peasants off the land and created a working class, which then allowed the rising capitalist class to employ workers in their factories and so forth. So it's it's never been a situation where we had a, a free market economy with very little government involvement and all that kind of stuff. That's a myth of the libertarians and people who support Milton Friedman's ideas and things like that. Um, so what we have today is capitalism in the sense that it's dominated by capital. It's dominated by the drive for profit. It's a competitive system. And even if you had this kind of capitalist utopia where Everybody had a small business and the government didn't interfere. The way capitalism develops, over time, concentration takes place. Um, businesses are driven out of business and they get bigger and so forth. And pretty soon you have monopolies that, that run things. And capitalists um, do not operate on principle. They operate on profit. So they're not going to go, oh, I'm a good libertarian, therefore I'm against the government being in, um, involved in the economy. No, they're going to go and bribe officials and get tax breaks and get good regulations and do all this kind of stuff. And they will always use the government for their own ends, no matter what. And so you can never have a situation where you have a pure free market economy where the government doesn't really interfere, because as soon as people get concentrations of wealth, they're going to go to the government and use the government to further their concentrations of wealth. So that's the way it's always going to be. So we live today very much in a capitalist society, I think. Yeah. We were talking just a, a bit in our group about um, um, ideology. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I grew up working class, but they were capitalists across the, across the, <coughs> the board. Um, they believed that it was working for them. And maybe in those days it was a little bit. We had stronger unions and so forth. But even today, and I think of Arizona as a state, but even today, um, with with the implosion of capitalism all around us, and so much evidence all around us, even today, people um, see themselves, see capitalism as basically benevolent mm -hmm. if it would just work for them. Um, and so, and one quick example, and I'd love your take on this. Like, here's a heresy that cannot be spoken or certainly acted on. And that is, uh, whatever Bill Gates is worth today, I'm not sure, let's say $90 billion or whatever, at what, at what point can we say to the 1% that it is absolutely immoral to make above a certain amount of wealth? Cut it off wherever you want, 10 billion, 1 million, it doesn't matter. You know, if society could cut that off and tax away the rest, that is inconceivable, unimaginable um, for the working class to actually um, call for that. And so what kind of practices um, do you recommend for people to see through the matrix in which they're living? Wow, that's the, that's the major question of the day, isn't it? How, how do we do that? Um, I think part of it is, cap the main thing is that capitalism is doing it for us. They're educating people about capitalism. Um, and so you have a situation where, you know, 50 years ago or something like that, everybody was, was for capitalism in the United States, or almost everybody. Today, I, I think during, after the Great Recession, we found that um, among people under 30, almost as many supported socialism as supported capitalism in an opinion poll by the Rasmussen Group. And there's been other polls since then that have replicated the same thing. Even among the general population, 20% of the U.S. population supported socialism over capitalism. And you got to remember that the United States is still the dominant world imperialist power, the richest country in the world, et cetera, et cetera. And 
um, it's hard to kind of break through that. But I think the more reality people see, the more questioning they are of the system. So you have the Occupy movement, where the we are the 99% became very, very popular, not just among people who are occupying, but all over the country. Um, and so I think it's partly the, the process of capitalism educating people, and then partly the process of us organizing and fighting back. And when we organize and fight back, we begin to challenge our ideas, the ideas that we've been taught. And so that, that's, a, that's a process because, I mean, there's different pressures going on all the time. There's the media, there's the politicians, there's, you know, think of what happened to the Boeing workers. What was good for the Boeing workers was to reject that contract, at least in my view, and I, in the view of a lot of Boeing workers, 49% of them the last time. Um, but the media kept barraging and barraging, and the politicians and all this kind of stuff. Oh, you're going you're gonna to kill everything, you're going to lose all your jobs, et cetera. Or the other, the other thing today uh, that we're dealing with in, with the 15 Now movement. Oh, you can't raise people's wages to $15 an hour. That's going to drive, that's going to kill jobs, right? So it's these kind of, uh, you know, ideological onslaughts that are going to go on to make people think that they have to be, quote, practical about things and live within the confines of the capitalist system. So it's going to take organizing, I think, um, struggles, but also counter, trying to counter that ideology in an organized way, uh, putting out the socialist case, um, et cetera, trying to educate people as much as possible. And the combination of those three things, I think, make it possible to break through that. But it's a hard job. It's not, it's not going to be easy. Do you think going at it sort of uh, step by step like that, like the $50 uh, an hour wage or whatever, that doing things kind of increment, incrementally like that would be more successful? is more successful or more likely to happen than just the <coughs> full deal. I mean, the full meal deal would be uh, like a major revolution, right? To, to really, well, you have to kind of go about it step by step, right? I guess I'm just wanting reinforcement for that thought. OK. Um, well, you're, so you're talking about the $15, first of all? Right, yeah, OK. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, let's, I don't know. Just look at this society. We have, in this area, we have two of the richest people in the whole world. Maybe three. Maybe I'm missing somebody. Okay, we got, we got Paul Allen, Bill Gates, we probably got a, Bezos. Bezos. Okay, yeah, we got a lot of these people, right? And they have so much money that they, they could not spend it if they tried in many lifetimes. And they, they don't really know what to do with it, right? And so we have, we, they decided, they, you know, the people who, who run things decided that we should have a tunnel through downtown Seattle, right? For, what is it, billions of dollars that's going to that's gonna cost? Four billion? Yep. Eleven. Okay, whatever. It's, it's going to be a hell of a lot of money, right? And now they're saying people can't get $15 an hour because the nonprofits in Seattle, if you read this Seattle Times article that came out recently, um, <laughs> would have to come up with $11 million. $11 million? And they're wasting several billion dollars to, to build a tunnel through downtown Seattle, which probably won't even ever get built. Or if it does, it'll make things worse. And as soon as somebody wants to have a new stadium, if they have money, they'll buy election after election until they get it. And they'll get the taxpayers to subsidize their stadium. So the money is there. Why? Why do we have to stay within these confines of, well, small businesses might go out of business if we raise the No, let's, let's have a radical approach. Let's, and it, this is way short of socialism, OK? I'm not, I'm not saying we need a socialist revolution right now. We need it, but we're not going to get it right now. But even way short of that, let's take a more radical approach to these things, right? Let's, let's look at the, where the wealth is and get at least all we're asking for is a little bit of that. How much would it cost to pay people in this city $15 an hour? It wouldn't be anywhere near what they're spending on a lot of this stuff, which is a waste anyway. So that's why I look at it. Um, first of all, would you say that we in this city and in this country live in a democracy? No. And then no. second, no. Representative government. would it be a democracy um, after some sort of socialist revolution? And, 
Um, no and yes. <laughs> we don't live in a, we live in a, what's known as a bourgeois democracy or a capitalist democracy. That is, we have elections, we have, you know, a certain amount of political freedom and that kind of thing. But we, but the people who really run things are the 1%. So, I mean, and they've told us this. Uh, you may have heard the quote from Woodrow Wilson from way back in the early 1900s. He said, yeah, if you come to Washington and want to talk to your representatives, they'll politely listen to you. But it, when they want to make decisions and they really want to hear what people have to say, they listen to the bankers and they listen to the big corporate, you know, corporate leaders and all and this kind of stuff. And that's the way that's the way it is. So it's run by and for the large concentrations of wealth. And and the thing about socialist democracy is the only way. Uh, what we're talking about is ending exploitation. That is making sure that people get the full value of what they produce, and that we generalize and plan and organize that kind of a system. And the only way you can do that is democratically. If you have a few people at the top running things again, like under Stalin's Russia or whatever, then they're gonna feather their own nest. They're gonna be the ones who are the new 1%, who take the wealth. So the only way you can really have a fair distribution of wealth and, a, and using it for human needs is if people are really in control of it, democratically. And so socialism and democracy a real, you know, Marxism and the Marxist view have to go together. If you don't have one, you can't have the, you know, you have to have them both together. Yeah. So I have a question about what it would really be like to live in a socialist uh, world that you envision, um, which I really don't fully understand. But supposing I'm a worker and uh, I'm working in an uh, industry that does something that's not particularly pleasant, like road construction or collecting garbage or washing dishes or something. Um, today, if you don't do the job, then you get the boot. You don't get the money, and then you're starved. You get thrown on the street. You can't pay your rent, right? So we have this totally hardcore incentive system to make sure that all those hard jobs get done. So then, uh, on the other hand, I lived in a communal uh, place, well, several times in my life, where you know, if you didn't want to do something, you kind of like duck out of there and not do that hard work. You know, one of them was in the navy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. So what's the incentive system in, in, uh, under socialism? For people that do things that are not fun, that are just, and a lot of work is not fun, let's face it. I think it's similar to the incentive uh, system when you live in a communal household with a whole bunch of people and somebody's got to clean the bathroom, right? It's like, nobody wants to do it, but it's got to get done, so you rotate it, you figure it out, you do whatever. So you, it's that kind of thing. I think if we had really unpleasant jobs, we would kind of share it out and not have a situation where somebody was uh, doing horrible work for 40 hours a week and somebody else was <coughs> doing very pleasant work for 40 hours a week. You know. But how it would be worked out would have to be democratically decided, I think. But it would be like peer pressure? or Suppose somebody just says, this slacker, does want to do the hard work? What about that? I mean, you know, that's what I would do. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I don't, I don't like hard work, you know? Yeah. But you've been raised in a capitalist society. Okay. <laughs> Mary? Yeah, and, and partly, in segue from that, I mean, any job, even a really boring one or even nasty one, is better when you're doing it with other people. I yeah. mean, in pre-state cultures, people actually sing while they work, tell stories while they work, whatever. You know, things like that. They're, they're human beings with each other while they're doing these tasks and it, it makes it um, bearable if not enjoyable. So one of my questions, or my question right now to Steve is, um, what's the role of non-monetary things in a socialist revolution? Now, I totally understand the importance of money, especially to people who don't have enough. It's crucial um, to, to uh, uh, our lives. But it's not the only thing that matters, of course. And Rich used the word moral somewhere in there. Um, in my group, we talked some about community. Um, you know, and at the risk of getting kind of vague and wishy-washy, you know, and, and having no teeth um, when you talk about community or, or morals, is there a role for these non-monetary things in a socialist revolution? Yes. I mean, I mean, I think that, <laughs> well, I, th I think that um, a big part of it is moral or sp spiritual or whatever you want to call it. It's like, 
you want to live in a, I mean, people generally want to live in a decent society. You know, it's, it's, even though we've been trained in a certain way, in a very competitive way, I think for, for a lot of people, or I would dare say most people, it is, it is kind of sickening and offensive when you see homeless people in the street. When you see racism, when you see sexism, when you see those kind of things, it just kind of makes you, rev kind of makes you sick, right? And you want, to, you want to live in a society where you can get along with people, where people care about each other, all of those kind of things. So that's part, that's part of what the whole struggle is about. I think it's about you know, redistributing the wealth or you know, taking over the wealth and using it, but it's not really so much about wealth. It's about creating a society where the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all. So where people can fully develop all of their human potential. And that's the kind of society we, that you know, Marx envisioned that's really part of the, the goal of a socialist revolution. So the, the, mon the, the fight against exploitation is the root of it and is important and has to be done in order to create a kind of a society where all of these other things are possible. So I, I don't know. It all, I mean, it also depends on how you define wealth. If you study neoliberal economics, you understand that money is debt. If everyone paid off all their debts, if the government paid off all their debts, and everybody in this room paid off all their debts, there'd be no dollars left in the system. Debt is money, and money is debt. That is how it works. So maybe it's not so much about talking about uh, uh, money and consumerism. Like, there's, there's so much in the world right now geared towards um, the desire to get out of that Bitcoin and time banks mm -hmm. and, and growing your own food, not relying on the money system itself. Uh, I don't have a question here. I'm just, I, I, I feel the need to say that because if there's any socialist revolution, I think you have to deal with the, the, the power that comes with money. Mm -hmm. um, and the money system itself mm -hmm. seems right. to be at the very root of all the corruption in both a socialist system and a capitalist system. Right, that's why, that's why the abolition of money is a very important part of the process. The, the problem is when, when you have a socialist revolution immediately, you can't just snap your fingers and get rid of money because there's, ration, there's a rationing system and that kind of thing. You have to get up to full levels of production where people can, from each according to their ability to each according to their needs as possible. When you, get to, when you develop things. But at that point, you can really, you can get rid of money. And, and you need to, because, you know, to get religious on you, the love of money is the root of all evil. Uh, well, I have more of a comment, too. But I think it's kind of remarkable, actually, given how much, like, greed and individualism and everything is drilled into us in our society, how much people still push it back against that. Like, you know, you look at the polls of like, right, the most recent poll, 68% of people in Seattle support a $15 minimum wage. And, you know, how are they fighting against it? Like, they can't just say, well, you can't have that because Walmart wants to make more profits. Then they try to focus it on the plight of small business owners to, again, appeal to people's human compassion, you know? Like, they have to appeal for that because it is something that I think is, is built into, into the way we operate. Um, as, you know, as human beings. But I think the other part of it, which is sitting back to, to your question about sort of the step-by-step -step versus all at once, is I think they can't really be counterposed. Like, you know, we can't sort of think about a revolution or socialism as taking all of the people existing in this society and plopping them into a different type of society, right? Because then we'd all be completely plagued by all of the shit that we've been trained in our whole lives. But it's actually the process of organizing around smaller things, around fighting for $15 minimum wage, around fighting for uh, and joining together in that fight that actually changes people's perspectives, changes people's outlook, changes pe the way people think about, you know, what does it mean to work, what does community mean, and sort of, you know, through that process. So I think, you know, there's, there's a great work, uh, book by Rosa Luxemburg that I encourage people to read called Reformer Revolution that sort of goes into that dynamic, but I think it's, you know, it's a, it's a dynamic process. Yeah, that, just real quick, real quick quote from Marx that expresses this. We need a revolution for two reasons. One, because the ruling class will not give up its wealth and power without one. And secondly, because 
only through the struggle can people change themselves to become fit to rule, is the way you put it. And so that's you know, the, the process that we was just talking about, about getting rid of racism, getting rid of sexism, pro-imperialist attitudes, et cetera, et cetera, learning to cooperate with each other, all of those kind of things. So we remake ourselves in the struggle. Um, so let's see. Yeah, in the back. Just a quick comment on I think I'm thinking of Maslow's hierarchy of needs here, where we live in a society where a lot of people aren't even at the, can't even deal with the base of the hierarchy of needs, but we're thinking about things at the, the highest level of the hierarchy of needs, which is like self actualization and kind of interesting. Yeah, the bath and the red. Yeah, but at least in the United States, we're in a society where people were at the higher level of need, and they remember that. <laughs> and so th this is just kind of opening up a contradiction <clears throat> here, where people were at a better level of life, and it's gone down, and they see the contradiction. So in this case, I don't see how you know the, the hierarchy of need actually um, is a good explanation as to um, the situation that people are in. It's it's more that the class inequality that's the situation right now, um, um, and I think that's maybe the thing that people are are seeing right now. Um, yeah. So you have, yeah. If you have, if you do fulfill people's needs which we haven't under this society, but we have the kind of society where people's material needs are met, then we can go on to the more you know, intellectual needs, artistic, all of those kind of things. So let's see. Um, Kat? Yeah, and I actually, even in the United States, I don't think we live in a world where we're at the highest levels of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I don't think all American citizens are that concerned with self-actualization. I think they're concerned about housing and food. Um, and I think part of the reason I'm an anti-capitalist is knowing that we have more empty houses in the United States, more foreclosed houses, than we do houseless people. I believe that if the people were really in charge of these decisions, we would very easily and quickly house those people. It would be a pretty simple solution. Um, and really those base human needs would be met and we'd be in a society where we were free to start thinking about those higher needs which I think are just as important. Um, and I think somebody was talking about sort of wealth and how we think about value in our culture. And for me, we're blessed with this huge wealth of the earth and corporations are killing it. There's no way that we're going to inherit all of the good things from the earth at this point. Um, but that's really where wealth and value come fr comes from for us as humans. Um, and I think that capitalism just really tricks us into thinking that value comes from other things. Yeah. I, I contend that our uh, modern um, marketing capitalist system does spend a fair amount of time addressing the base Maslow uh, hierarchy of needs. If you, if you look at advertising, it's always one of three categories, food, shelter, and sex. And it, I think it's really kind of dumbed down America that uh, in addressing the, the base needs of, of, uh, of humanity, we really haven't gone to the higher levels of humanity. That you know, really, all marketing does now, and it's, it's probably because capitalists know that it's easy to make profits off the base needs of humanity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are we to assume that all of this could be accomplished without shedding any blood? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. Um, at least not in my view. I mean, that's a debate. That's a long debate and a long discussion. I think that history shows that the people who have the wealth and power will never give it up without a fight. Um, but, you know, if they suddenly have a moral transformation, that would be wonderful. And I'd all be in, I'd be in favor of, you know, a total nonviolent revolution. But I don't, I don't see that, foresee that uh, happening. But one thing, I think if we look at the Russian Revolution, where they were most, the most organized in uh, St. Petersburg, there was, there were, it was an armed revolution, for sure. But the, the worker side was so well armed and so well organized that there was almost no bloodshed in the capital city when they took over. So there's a difference between a, a violent, in the sense of bloody revolution on the one hand and an armed revolution on the other. 
I mean, sometimes they're the same, but they don't always have to be. And in the case of the Russian Revolution, they weren't. Um, so what, I think what that tells us is that we have to be well armed and prepared. Otherwise, there will be a lot of bloodshed. If we just walk out in the street you know, and say, we're going to take over now, they're going to, if they got the machine guns, they're still going to use them. But one of the key things about the Russian Revolution and other revolutions has been that the rank and file of the military, or at least big sections of it, have been won over to the side of the revolution. And when they come over to the side of the revolution, they bring their, they bring their weapons with them. And so that's a, an important part of the process. If we just have a revolution where it's the civilians against the military, we're going to lose. So we're going to have to win over sections of the military. Um, and that's always been the case in every single successful revolution. Um, so, and then I think that we all know about this, but I'll just throw this in. I think it's important to understand that, that capitalism is a very violent system on a daily basis. People are starved to death, et cetera. People are homeless and dying in the street, all of these kind of things. So it's not a question of, well, we don't have violence now, and now, oh, do we want a violent revolution? It's like, if you don't have a, vi if you don't have a revolution, you're going to have the continual capitalist violence all the time. And pe more people are going to die. And the way things are going, maybe the civilization will collapse you know, with the global warming, et cetera. So. Yeah. Uh, you've been around Seattle a long time. And you know the different socialist organizations. So I'd love to hear a little summary of what are the names of the uh, leading socialist organizations in Seattle, and what are, are, are there, uh, why aren't they united? What are their differences? <laughs> How many hours do you have? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, would, um, I could just give a very, very capsule, and then I really invite people to, to do their own research, and you know, glad to talk to you about the ISO, there's other, People, Dan is in Socialist Alternative. Other people are willing, you know, I'm sure would be glad to talk to you about this. But basically, kind of what I laid out is our view is socialism from below. That is ordinary working class people taking control, workers' democracy. And um, on the other side, the, what's known as socialism from above, in a sense, is social democracy and Stalinism, where social democracy believes that you can elect people up here and they can take care of things, you know, just pass some good laws. On the other hand, the Stalinist movement uh, believed that you can nationalize everything under a government that's run from the top by a small group of people, and that'll take care of everything. Either way, it's a top-down approach, and instead, what we really need is a bottom-up grassroots approach. So that's the tradition that the ISO stands in. Um, there are some groups in Seattle that are in the Stalinist tradition. Uh, the main, I'd say, social democratic group in the United States is the Democratic Socialists of America, who not only believe that capitalism can be reformed, but they also believe that the Democratic Party can be reformed. Uh, you know, but, so that's kind of the, you know, but I could certainly talk to anybody about in specific groups in Seattle in more detail. Is it possible to, to have uh, a successful uh, socialist revolution in, in one country and have that country survive as socialist successfully? No. No. What's, what's the ratio that would need to, to happen? Uh, well, again, that's, that was a, you know, within, this, within the left, that's, that's what's the debate. The Stalin, Stalin aside said yes. Socialism in one country. When Russia was isolated after 1917, Stalin came to power with a new bureaucracy which exploited everybody and, and so forth and created what we call state capitalism. That is, the workers were still exploited, they were still competing with other countries and all that kind of stuff, um, but it was run by the state. So but I'm talking about a real socialist country. In your opinion, uh, by your definition, a, a successful socialist revolution well, Can one country survive in the world economy? Not for a very long period of time. It, it would have to be spread pretty quickly. I mean, we're not, we can't expect that, so, that revolution is going to break out in every country at the same moment, but like if workers took power in one country, they would, it would have to begin to spread to other countries, or they would be isolated just like Russia was. So that's, yeah. So the other side of that question is, uh, if, 
is there if there is uh, if everybody's socialist except for one powerful country, can socialism survive? I mean, does one bad apple, uh, one bad powerful apple, spoil the whole barrel, or what? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I don't think I've ever heard that one before. Um, I don't know, but we. I mean, the, the point is to have a revolution in that one bad apple, because it, be, it would create problems for sure. It would make it harder to, to move forward all the way. Whether it would totally derail the operation, I don't, I don't know. But it would, it's definitely would be a goal to spread the revolution to that other country as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't think we can pretend anymore that state actors like 50 years ago are as powerful as they were. The real actors in the world are multinational corporations and centralized authorities like central banks and multinationals. Those are state actors in terms of power. Have, it's shifted in the last 50 years as capitalism has taken over the entire paradigm. So I, I think any discussion of can a socialist country survive needs to take that into account. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a real interesting point. And I think that um, Actually, that's a, a big debate on the left as well. There's been a lot of articles or books and so forth written on all sides of this. Just real briefly, I think that that argument has been uh, stretched a little too far in the sense that the governmental apparatuses, the states, the military, are still needed to back up the multinational corporations. And so there's a direct connection between the corporations and the states. So, I mean, just look at what's happening today in the Ukraine, for example. I mean, so. But it, but it is a, a really important discussion that you know, people should look into. Yeah. Why is it that uh, one country uh, socialists wouldn't survive long in the world economy? Why, why couldn't it survive? Sorry. Well, because it would be attacked. Same, what happened with Russia? It was that the capitalists don't want to see a successful worker state moving towards socialism. So they invaded Russia, 17 different foreign armies invaded, including the United States, by the way, which occupied parts of Russia for a while. Um, that's the main reason. But the other thing is, to really develop the productive forces, you have to, it has to be done on a world scale. It's, it doesn't really work in one country. You, know, you, don't need, you don't have all the resources you need or all the industry you need and so forth. So it's gotta be a cooperative effort on a kind of a world scale as well. So that's the other side of the argument in the long run. But the immediate thing would be that the capitalists would try to economically and militarily attack that one isolated state. So, um, and this is fascinating. And I, I, I really, I, I appreciate this whole evening with you. And, uh, and yeah, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking that this is also utopian. And, and, and that's familiar to me because, you know, as a Christian, we have our own utopian traditions um, that never seem to come to pass. Jesus doesn't return. The Jubilee never got implemented. Um, but I, my question to you is, is um, and, and so, you know, you know the, the Christian tradition has this notion of sin and brokenness, and you've got to deal with the stuff that's, you know, violence runs through every human heart. We've lifted that stuff up as well. Ending exploitation, which is easy to say and difficult to do because it's in my heart. It's not just in the structures. Um, but because it's so utopian, um, a practical question I have for you is um, um, I am quite taken with the vision of worker co-ops. Mm -hmm. um, because they fit into capitalism, mm -hmm. but the philosophy behind it isn't capitalist because it's not a pyramid. One person doesn't accrue the power. So as a practical, as a practice to move us towards socialism, um, I would just like to hear your feedback. I'm, I'm, I'm just getting totally behind worker co-ops as a, an alternative to living in the matrix. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's a good, you know, that's a good question. And that, again, that's also a long, long-standing uh, debate in the left. Um, I think, I'm not against workers' co-ops. I think that's, they're fine, but I don't see them as a way to actually transform the system because basically what happens with workers' co-ops 
is they become subsumed in the capitalist system and they have to compete. They have to exploit themselves. The drives of capitalism continue. They be, it's like, a, in some ways, like any, any other small business, right? They have, to, they have to cut their costs, they have to compete, they have to do all those kind of things. So the idea of using that as a springboard doesn't, I don't think really works. Um, most co-ops end up going back to the capitalist form after a while. So there were, yeah. I mean, so is your conclusion that you have to wait for Jesus? I mean, that's, I mean, that's what the church ran into, is we couldn't wait any longer. We had to start practicing. Well, it's a debate over Jesus, too. Was he a communist or not? Some, a lot of people think he was. All right, there we go. Uh, but no, we don't, we don't have to wait. We, we need to struggle right now, like the things like 15 Now or the fight against mass incarceration or labor struggles, all those kind of things to build up, to win gains right now, but also to build up the forces of, on our side. So it isn't a matter of waiting or not waiting. It's a matter of doing both at the same time, I think. Okay, I, yeah, I'd like to, um, we, have a, we have a contact, the uh, ISO has a contact list back here if you'd like to find out more and so forth and take a look at the literature table. And um, again, the next meeting next Tuesday will be on the rent's too damn high and encourage people to come to that. And um, thank you very much. It's been a good discussion.